Now, this is a short segment, long segment coming up. We're very thankful that he uh, has been able to join us. He is Dr. Busby. Christopher Busby is a chemical physicist and British scientist known uh, for his groundbreaking research on the health effects of cumulative low-level uh, ionizing radiation. He advises the Parliament in England, the EU, uh, and he broke a lot of news on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster that turned out to be absolutely accurate. In fact, he's very conservative compared to some of the alarmists that are out there, uh, and uh, he joins us now uh, to give us a little breakdown on what's coming up in the next 18-minute uh, segment, a new and a peer-reviewed Journal of Pediatrics report about uh, increased problems in thyroid of babies, children, and others on the West Coast. And, of course, we have all the reports of the rising radiation levels and, and governments raising what they say is cumulatively safe and m the majority of reactors leaking. So we're going to talk about that and the removal of the fuel rods, uh, what's currently happening at Fukushima as the, as the, the ground basically turns into a huge sinkhole. Uh, Dr. Busby, uh, thank you for joining us. Hello. Uh, we got about two minutes. Tell us, uh, tell us what's coming up. Well, two things, really. I, I think you, um, you wanted me to talk about the worst-case scenario. You know, in other words, if the whole of Fukushima goes up with a big bang, yes, what's going to happen? That's the first thing. And the second thing is I'll talk about the new study that, that we've done, which shows that there were effects from the tiny amounts of radi radiation that came to the United States from Fukushima, levels that were much lower than natural background radiation, but actually had a significant effect on babies who were born in California. Um, so it just shows that all this stuff about natural background radiation as a yardstick for comparing the effects of ionizing radiation is just such, not, such a lot of nonsense. And that's because, sure, the background only goes up a little bit, but what happens if you get the concentrated particles that are radiating overall? It's kind of like a light bulb 100 yards away won't burn your hand. And they go, oh, that's background radiation. But when you grab it with your hand, it starts burning you. What happens if you breathe it or eat it? Well, that's kind of it, really. Uh, and particularly, um, of course, the babies in the womb are very, very sensitive. And there's been lots of research done recently that shows that, that millions of babies have died in the womb as a result of really quite low levels of, of internal radiation after these various accidents that have taken place. Um, and of course, after the weapons test fallout, which is the biggest injection of radioactivity into the world environment that's ever occurred. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, All right. too. Well, Dr. Busby, you'll have the floor, llrc.org, greenaudit.org, a true environmentalist joining us, a true conservationist who actually wants humans to survive. Why is nascent iodine so important? Nascent iodine is so important because it goes directly to the thyroid. It's not bonded to a salt, which means it doesn't have to be broken down. And it's the most usable form. It's what the body uses. It's what the body is designed to use. If you have low energy levels, if you have pains, if you have thyroid problems, if you don't feel up to par, well, they've proven now that the fluoride and a lack of iodine causes a decreased IQ because you have all this stuff that builds up inside your system and builds up and builds up. And that's why some people, when they start taking iodine, will have what's called a Hertzheimer reaction or a detoxification reaction. But that's a good sign. That means you're detoxifying all that fluoride buildup, the mercury buildup in there, the bromine buildup in your system, and the chlorine buildup in your system. You don't want those things. All of those things have been proven as carcinogens. That's one of the reasons prostate cancer is on the rise, too, is because prostate takes up iodine and the men that are lacking iodine causes the prostate to become cystic and causes the prostate to swell and eventually leads to prostate cancer. There's been an extreme rise in polycystic ovarian disease, PCOS with women, fibrocystic breast disease because iodine is stored in the breast tissue, the ovaries, the prostate glands in men. It's utilized by every single cell in the body. Mm, why does this almost taste good compared to other iodine that tastes horrible? That's because it's real iodine atomic form. We wanted something that's going to go straight into the bloodstream and straight into the thyroid gland. We wanted to put it in a vegetable glycerin base. That's a USP kosher certified vegetable glycerin base. And that product is not tested on animals. It's vegan friendly. It's gluten free. It's GMO free. Of all the things I've done, nascent iodine was just absolutely amazing. So we developed with Dr. Group a double strength, low price. InfoWars Life. Dot com survival shield the atomic nascent iodine available right now
By the way, going to break, I said that Dr. Christopher Busby is a real environmentalist. They're destroying the earth. They're dumping toxic waste everywhere. Open air genetic engineering that infects other families, not even plants, but, but animal, insect, uh, you name it. it. It's all spreading. In every major study, the GMO is, is just wreaking havoc on the reproductive systems of the animals that eat it. 91% uh, of reactors, according to the UN, are, are, are leaking. They don't even care if they leak now. The troops are allowed to use DU in the last 20 years. Now they use it at regular shooting ranges. And then meanwhile, they've got this big corporate environmentalism that only wants to tax people's houses or energy consumption and things that really, compared to all of the leaking radiation and the toxic waste and the genetic pollution, that, that, that really is screwing things up. I mean, the honeybees really are dying. Uh, the, the human cancers really are up multi-thousand percentage points in the West. I mean, this is all real. And if they came out, I mean, when the government came out and said, okay, we're going to ban BPA, for babies. I was like, yes, ban it. It's like real stuff, real things. Instead of diverting into certain corporations like General Electric being exempt from their plants being shut down, or they go build plants in Mexico and then shut down clean plants in Texas and then run you know, dirty coal into the air. It's in, folks, these corporations have used the environmental movement to take over. And then I see all the fake left from George Monbiot to you name it, promoting nuclear now when I was somebody growing up bought into nuclear power propaganda, bought into all of it. And back then it looked like it was managed a little bit better. Maybe, maybe we're just more informed now and all the nuclear disasters they've covered up. So now I see it as, is there any form of safe nuclear power? That's a question I'm going to ask Dr. Busby at the end of the interview in about 25 minutes, but I want to give him the floor now because they're going to remove the fuel rods that started. They're saying that could trigger a disaster. Uh, we've got, you know, cover-ups of uh, the uh, yellowfin tuna having higher levels of radiation. We've got this new study that he helped author uh, that's in the peer-reviewed Journal of Pediatrics, uh, where you can read it on uh, his site, uh, llrc.org. We're going to link it up on Infowars.com. Changes in confirmed plus borderline cases of congenital hyperthyroidism in California as a function of environmental fallout from the Fukushima nuclear meltdown. So he joins us right now to talk about worst case scenarios, what's currently happening there with the ground sinking. Uh, you've got the floor. Give us a presentation, Dr. Busby. Well, let me start then with the the, uh, <coughs> the, th the, the congenital hyperthyroidism paper. Um, because the important thing about that is, it, it, in a way, it introduces us to the main problem in all of this. Um, because what, what we did, this was uh, my colleagues Joe Mangano and Janet Sherman of the Radiation and Public Health Project in New York um, and, and I, we, we studied the levels of thyroid stimulating hormone that are measured in, in blood samples taken at birth in the state of California over the period of the Fukushima um, catastrophe. Now, you all know that a small amount of radioiodine, and it was a very small amount of radioiodine, uh, by the time it got across the 5,000 miles from Fukushima to California, to the west coast of the United States, the concentrations were really quite small. But nobody <coughs> could be, should be complacent uh, uh, because they were such small concentrations. What happened at the time, of course, is that there was a, big, uh, a lot of yelling and screaming about the fact that there was radio, radioactive iodine 131 measured in the milk. And, and the engineering department at the University of Berkeley um, measured, I think, between 5 and 10 um, becquerels per litre of radioiodine 131 in rainwater. Now... From, from that, we, we, it's, it's fairly easy to work out roughly what the dose would be. Iodine-131 has quite a short half-life, about eight days. And so really, this event only occurred over a period of about 10 or 15 days. So you can work out what the dose is to, to adults, assuming that they just drank rainwater. Well, of course, people don't drink rainwater, do they? They drink water from the tap or from bottles. Uh, but anyway, let's take the worst case and say that, it was the, that they were only drinking rainwater. The dose that they would have got is about one hundredth of natural background radiation, the annual dose from natural background radiation. So in other words, it's a very, very, very small dose. Um, and by the time that it got down to the baby, you know, it would have been even smaller. And yet, 
what we discovered was that was there was a highly statistically significant increase in uh, congenital hypothyroid in, in confirmed congenital hypothyroid cases in babies in California and in borderline cases about 27 percent now it may not sound very much it's about 400 babies and 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 you know it's not a good thing that that happened but the most important thing in all of this in this paper is that once again we see that the concept of dose um, is not valid for the measurement of inter for the quantification for the understanding of the health effects of internal radionuclides like radioiodine and like these particles that you were talking about um, which give a lot of dose to one little piece of the body and no dose at all to the rest so this concept again and again we see that this concept of absorbed dose when the, um, is not valid whenever we see in in the news that there's been an accident um, or that there's been some release of radioactivity somewhere then what happens is is the nuclear industry or the the scientists from the government and this is awful too because it's very very few real scientists left anyway these scientists we will put that in inverted commas scientists come out and they say oh well the dose is too low for it to cause you any harm um, this is what they scream at any argument that says that we're being irradiated by all these substances which which first appeared on the planet in the 1950s with the weapons fallout and then increased increasingly were produced by nuclear power stations and accidents and so forth not you know and not 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 forgetting the depleted uranium that we're talking about so the, the one message that we take home from this study is that the, the concept of dose is invalid and, and also the other thing that we went to at the end of this study was the increases in thyroid cancer which have been detected now in Fukushima. So only three years after the accident we see an in, a, a rapid increase in thyroid cancer in children aged 0 to, to 18. And I did a calculation on this which enables me to work out what the relative risk is, you know, the, the percentage higher than, than what you would expect if there had been no, no event. And we get an 80-fold excess. So there's an 80 times the numbers of thyroid cancers that you would expect normally. Now, this is an enormous number. But of course, what's happening there is that these same scientists, these tame scientists that work for the government, or even, the, even in fact the scientists who measured the thyroid cancers, who detected them in the screening, they say, well, it can't be from Fukushima because the dose is too small. So we live in a sort of Alice in Wonderland world, or sort of like an airbrushed world, which is much worse than the original Soviet Union way in which you know things were covered up because at the moment it's covered up in such a way that it's utterly bizarre. Anyway, that, so that's the message from from the uh, from the paper that that we've just published. And, and let me just briefly tell listeners uh, that physicist, uh, chemical physicist Christopher Busby. Uh, joins us. And I want to back up what he's saying. I'm not a chemical physicist or a nuclear physicist. Who is a chemical physicist, uh, as well as a nuclear physicist, is uh, Dr. Doug Rocky, who was the head of the entire Pentagon DU program in the 80s and 90s, who wrote the book on it and did the, the uh, removal of the waste in Kuwait and Iraq. Most of his team has died. He, he, long before I even ever interviewed Dr. Busby, he would come on 10 years ago. Plus, he's had over 50 surgeries just to survive. More surgeries than probably Darth Vader had fictionally. And, and, and he, the way he explains it, he goes, it's asinine saying we could use DU. They wouldn't let us use it until 1990 because all the physicists, even going back to the 50s, said if you ingest it in your lungs or your kidneys, it goes into the cell at point-blank range and fries them. And, and they use the analogy, basically, of the light bulb. A light bulb off at 100 yards doesn't burn you. If you go up and grab it, it will cook your hand. And that's basically what's happening. And then uh, they've had other physicists that I've interviewed and other people you know, have explained this over and over again. And so the system knows full well what they're doing because previous to uh, really the 1990s, there was an argument saying it's bad, it's good, it's okay. Now they just don't seem to care. So let me ask you this and then get into the rest of it. Why doesn't the power structure seem to care anymore that they're living in increased radioactive poison? Well, this is a very good question. I don't really have an answer for it. I mean, because to me and to you and to any sensible person thinking about it, of course, what they're doing is, is that they're, um, they're destroying themselves and their children and, the, and all their relatives. Um, and, and one has to ask, ask, how is it possible that they can do this? I mean, some of them are physicists. And I have to say, physicists seem to have the ability to deal in a sort of world of abstract mathematics. 
Um, and I think I, 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 I particularly single out physicists for the ability to believe something which is totally impossible. Um, and, a lot, and a lot of modern physics is like that. And you will find in governments that, 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 the, that the scientific advisors to governments are very often particle physicists. And I think this goes back to the, to the school days where, where you know, if, if you were a physicist or a mathematician, you were assumed to be cleverer than somebody who wasn't, who was a chemist, and then it goes down to biologists, and after that it sort of goes down to geographers, and then people who read English and history and so on, all the way down to the bottom. Um, and so the problem is that these people have, have got the idea that because they can do mathematics and they can create these wondrous worlds of equations, uh, including the, the world of the equations that describe absorbed dose, of course, exactly that, they don't need to know about biology. And in fact, I've talked to them and they've said, well, I don't know about bi biology. If I need to know about biology, I'll ask a biologist. And of course, if a biologist comes along saying, well, I'm sorry, mate, but everybody's dying because you've got it wrong, they will just say, oh, you're not a physicist. And it goes on like that. So that's one part of the equation. The other part, of course, is that there are some genuinely evil people up there, in my opinion. I mean, I've met some of them. There are people who are up there for their own reasons, uh, you know, because they make money or because they, they have a, a, a high position and because, as Proudhon, the anarchist, once said, if you put a man in uniform, he becomes a monster. And I think there are people like that. I mean, I can, I can give you examples. One good example is the, head, is the ex-head of the International Commission on Radiological Protection, who, who is now the head of, um, of the medical system. He's the head of the social security system in Sweden, a man called Lars Erik Holm. I mean, he is very much, you know, I, I think in my opinion, he is uh, individually responsible for the deaths of several million people. Um, I, we, you know, we talk about Hitler and we talk about Saddam Hussein and all these people who are like monsters, you know, within the concept of the historical description of monsters. But actually, a lot of these physicists who, who, who have continued to underpin this ridiculous system of absorbed dose are responsible for a lot more deaths than Hitler. It's really incredible, but but the way that uh, Dr. Rocky and others uh, that we've interviewed, uh, the former head of the Star Wars program, nuclear physicist, uh, engineer, chemical physicist, Dr. Bob Bowman just died a few months ago. Uh, he said, look, of course, there, if, if people get hot particles, they'll be the ones in the Russian roulette that, you know, died 10 years after, hypothetically. He said, look at... Look at uh, what happened with Chernobyl. We have metrics we can break down that the UN says around a million plus people have died from cancers as an effect of that. And they took measures to not drink the milk from Europe for a few years, to not you know, eat the vegetables in those areas, to, to import them. Now they don't even try to mitigate anything. They just say it's fine. Don't even tell people the tuna is radioactive, that the milks had this problem or surface vegetables like spinach and things. But he, he was a physicist. He described it. He knew. And, and, and that's how Dr. Rocky describes it. He says, look, prior to 1990, no one would use this. But then they just said, don't worry about it. And then they would at least try to wear masks and gloves. Now they don't wear masks and gloves when they use DU. I mean, it really just shows a mass delusion, uh, a hyper nihilistic, I don't even know what you call it, but I don't want to waste any more time on that, Dr. Busby. Get into the removal of the rods. Uh, the sinking, I know it has a scientific name, uh, into a sinkhole of the Fukushima situation. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, other physicists, uh, you know, the fellow from Canada, you know, came out and kind of did, did a gestalt saying that if it does melt down, it could, you know, really threaten humanity. Goodbye, Japan, I think was the quote from Suzuki. What is the worst case scenario? Okay, right. Well, I'll go to that. Well, before I do, let me just say that, that there is a bit of news on the, on the DU front, which is that increasingly I'm being contacted by Gulf War veterans in the United Kingdom who are now aged about 40. And, and they're, they're, there's a massive increase in cancer amongst those people. So, I mean, just by the way, that's now, that's now feeding through into the system. Because, of course, as you say, it takes several years, you know, 10, 15 years before these particles create sufficient dose to the local tissue to, to, to develop cancer. Well, now those years have passed and we're, we're beginning to see the beginning of an epidemic there. Um, anyway, so, so over to, the, to Fukushima. Right. Well, I have seen on, on the internet and, and uh, people have contacted me with, with uh, amazing doom-laden sort of prospects if, if the whole lot goes up. 
and and in, and people have been asking me more and more to sort of get in there and have a look at it all. And it is actually quite complicated, and you've got to do lots and lots of sums and get all the numbers from all over the place, work it all out. This, you know, I've been working on this off and on for about six weeks. And eventually, I've figured it all out. So now I'm going to present you with the answer. And the answer is this: that it's not the end of the world, and it's, and, you know, by no means is it the end of the world. Although it probably is the end of Japan. So that's the, that's the headline. Um, if the thing goes up. And, and uh, what I mean now, in my, in my um, what will we call it, worst case scenario, like the worst thing that could possibly happen is this, that the, that, that the reactor 4 tank um, collapses in some way. You know, either it explodes because they stick two rods too, too close together and there's an explosion which drives out all the water and then, you know, that once the water's gone, it all melts down. Uh, and then, and then, of course, it distills off the plutonium, and then there's a critical mass, and there's an enormous bang. So you get a, a fission, fission explosion. The alternative is that the 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 thing is sitting, as you said, in a sort of swamp now, and leaning. And so, and of course, they know this too. So, so you know, that, that's why they're, they're they're rapidly pulling all the all the spent fuel out of that that number four tank. So, if that collapsed, um, if it actually fell over, then of course the water would all slosh out of the tank. That there would be no cooling for half of the tank, and then of course it would melt down. The heat would increase; it would boil off the water, distill the plutonium, and bang. Um, and then of course the third possibility is we have another typhoon. Which, which, so all all of these things are possible ways in which we can get a, la a large bang. Now let's assume the bang is big enough to also destroy the cooling to the other radio to the other um, reactors, buildings, uh, pressure vessels. So let's, let's, let's imagine that the whole lot goes up in some kind of massive, dirty fission bomb. Now, we have to, we have to note here that, that if it does explode, it will be a fission bomb. It's not going to be a hydrogen bomb. There's going to be no megaton explosions. The worst that can happen is that there's going to be some massive fission event. Now, if that happens, we know, uh, as a result of various studies that have been done, exactly what's in there. Well, not exactly, but pretty much what's in there. If, and we can add it all together. And then we can compare it uh, in terms of, of releases to all of the other events that people compare it to, and I've done that. So, I mean, I can give you lots and lots of numbers, but, but basically those numbers would, would, wouldn't really mean anything. So I, what, I've done it in, uh, what I've done is I've compared it in terms of two of the main radionuclides. These are the, the, most, the most dangerous ones and the ones that are usually uh, uh, used to, to assess any any um, event, any of these, you know, um, exposure events. Uh, I've compared the strontium-90 and cesium-137 with the Hiroshima bomb, because that's one that everybody does, and with the Fukushima that's already happened, that's like, if you like to call it Fukushima-1, and then with Chernobyl in 1986, and then, and then, of course, and this is the big one, with the atmospheric nuclear testing, 1952 to 1980. Because what I conclude in all of this, and I think I've said it before, is that actually, even if everything went up from, from, from um, Fukushima, it would still not be as much as the injection into the world environment, the global environment, from the, from the combined atmospheric nu nuclear tests between 1952 and 1980. It comes to about 60% of them. So if we take all of the radionuclides that came out in the, in the atom bombs and the explosions that occurred in in, in uh, the Marshall Islands, the, Amer the United States Marshall Islands tests, and then, of course, the British tests at Christmas Island and the French tests at Mururoa and in North Africa, and then, of course, the enormously big Russian tests in Kazakhstan, the Tsar Bomber, which was 40 megatons. These, these tests blew an enormous amount of radioactivity up into the stratosphere, where it came pitter-patter, pitter-patter down for the, for the, uh, after about 1959, uh, through to 1964, and the strontium-90 built up in everybody's bones, and the iodine went everywhere, and the tritium increased, and, 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 and carbon-14 increased, and, and uh, Sakharov and Pauling both said that this would cause enormous increases in cancer, which, of course, it has done. Um, and so compared to that, if the whole of Fukushima goes up, it will only be about the same as that, actually less, about half of it, 60%. So, so the total contents of the Fukushima is about 60%, of the total releases from the atmospheric tests. But actually, it'll be a lot less than that. And the reason is that the atmospheric tests blew all this stuff into the global environment with their enormous power. But, but this will be like a, a, a fairly local fission bomb. 
And so it will cause massive contamination of the local Pacific and, 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 and catastrophic contamination of northern Japan, of course. I mean, I worked out that the, the mean concentration in the whole of northern Japan would be about 16 megabecquerels per square meter, which would give you a dose of about, uh, what have I got here, a dose rate of 50 microsieverts per hour, which is like... But Ann Coulter says that's good for you. Ah, yes. Well, he should go there if it happens there. <laughs> <laughs> he should. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, of course, all that, that, all that stuff is nonsense. Although there is, a, uh, to be honest with you, there, there is a certain element of truth in this homesis idea. You know, if you, if, you do give, if you do give mice a little bit of external radiation, and I have to say it's external radiation that they're talking about, um, then what it does is it, over a period of time, it beefs up the, repairs, the, the repair systems in the cells slightly. And, and, that's, and that can be shown. But, of course, uh, the problem with internal radiation is it doesn't give a very small increase in dose to the cell. It gives an enormous in in dose to the cell. I mean, one alpha particle from... Um, well, to put this in perspective, if you, take, uh, if you take natural background radiation, which everyone uses as a yardstick, we'll say that two millisieverts, to go to this dose argument, is the annual dose to, to a cell, two millisieverts. But if you get a single alpha particle track from a, a uranium particle to a cell, it's 500 millisieverts. And if it's actually a, par actually a particle sitting there, not moving anywhere, it's going to be banging away with more and more and more of these. It's going to be like the first one is 500 millisieverts, then it'll, then it'll get another one, so that's 1,000 millisieverts, and so on. So for internal radiation, like you, you know, your argument about the light bulb, the levels of actual dose to the cell are enormously high. They're, they're very, very much higher than these le levels of natural background radiation we're talking about. It's the, it's the light bulb effect that you're talking about, which is actually the problem. And, and also, in terms of uranium, of course, it binds to DNA. So not only is it banging, it, uh, banging the alpha particle into the cell, but because it has an extraordinarily high chemical affinity for DNA. I was about to say, that's what Dr. Rocky said in the Pentagon study, some of it secret, a lot of it public. He said it's not just the radiation. He said, chemically, it's an incredible poison. That's right, it is. It is. I mean, nobody knows quite why. It's a, I mean, well, at least, it, what, what, doc, what Rocky is saying is that it's a chemical poison. My own feeling is it's not, so, it's not a chemical poison. It's a chemical radioactive poison. So, in other words, it combines its chemistry, its chemical affinity for DNA with its increased Sure, sure. He's just saying it's incredibly toxic in his words. Yes, yes. Well, of course it is. Of course it is. I mean, the work that we've done in Fallujah has shown the highest levels of, of um, cancer that have ever, ever been reported in any study anywhere. I mean, the levels of, of, of leukemia right. that we were finding in Fallujah were like 38 times the expected number based on, based on the background. I was about to say, even, even like six, seven years ago, right after Fallujah, within a year, they were talking about birth defects. I think the headline was 16 times the previous yes. record. That's right. That's right. It's it's a, it's it's a, it's an absolute genetic damage catastrophe in in Fallujah, and nobody's doing anything about it. What happened was that the World Health Organization produced some utterly bogus study, which which actually showed that there were no effects there at all, um, which which are, which I've attacked roundly in, in in various various arguments in various media reports. It's quite extraordinary. And, Don't and, and, the people putting out the bull know that their bull won't protect them from radiation? Well, we're back to that argument again, aren't we? We're back. We're, I suppose. I suppose you know. And and the trouble is, if you're an ordinary human being like you and me, I mean, I think maybe we are sort of a little bit more ordinary than these people that are allowing this to go on. Anyway, you just can't understand it. What happens is you just your mouth just drops open, and you think, well, how is it, and why is it that they continue to do this? Well, I mean, like I said, some of them are, are not very nice people. And some of them do it because they obtain power out of it, and they'd rather have power sure. than mind about their children dying of leukemia. Um, but the other ones that go along with it, like sheep, God, goodness only knows why they do that. They're just I so mean, domesticated. I Shifting gears, though, uh, just the argument against nuclear power now, when you look at the response in Fukushima, or you look at how they respond here in Southern California when the alarm goes off, now they've just permanently turned the alarms off. It just shows government at this stage with its management cannot be trusted with corporations to run nuclear power. Well, I, I, I remember that uh, John Goffman said that the nuclear industry is waging a war against humanity. But I would now put it further than that. I would say that global science is waging a war against humanity. 
I mean, like you said before, it's not just nuclear. It's, it's in every single area where scientific developments can be, made, can be used to make money for the monster that has now become global, cap global capitalism. Um, people just turn a complete blind eye to any, any effects on, on human life and just march on steadily with the production of substances which they release to the environment, which kill people. Sounds That's like the legend of Atlantis. Whether it was true or not, they created some technology that blew up their island. Yes. Well, it does look like we're doing that. Doctor, fact, let me do five more minutes. I know you've got to go. We're going to do some overdrive. I want you to have closing comments and talk about what we do. Is there any safe atomic or nuclear power? What do we do with all these 35, 40-year-old aging things everywhere leaking? And uh, what do we do? Because I've got children. I don't right. want to die of cancer young. I don't want to die, period. This is really scary. We're going to be back in 60 seconds with Dr. Busby. Stay with us. I'm Darren McBreen, and these are some of the new items that are available now at InfoWarsShop.com. Alert the public to Obama's blatant abuse of power with the new Obama t-shirt. Obama's joker face on the front and come and take it on the back. It's time to publicly call him out for what he is, a tyrant. Defend the Second Amendment with our top seller come and take it t-shirts. And look at that, women's cut tank tops and t-shirts now available. Nice hat. Plus, the Don't Tread on Me flag. And now you can become a micro distributor of the InfoWars magazine. Plus, get your own copy delivered right to your door each and every month. And if you're tired like I am of you and your family being exposed to polluted drinking water, get the Pro One High Performance Water Filter. It gets rid of all pathogenic bacteria, cysts, fluoride, heavy metals, and numerous other contaminants. So join the revolution at InfoWarsShop.com. All right, final segment with Dr. Busby. I'm going to continue on with some overdrive in the next segment. We go to Julio listening on 1530 AM in Chicago, Ramon and uh, Tanner and Rose and Mercedes and Everybody else that's patiently holding. Dr. Busby, we've only got about four or five minutes in the short segment. Folks can go see your studies and the other mainline studies you link to at llrc.org, greenaudit.org, and uh, hopefully find out about uh, what's happening. But you heard my question. Is there any form of safe atomic or nuclear power? No, there isn't. Uh, it's not possible to constrain the atom. It's not possible to do anything with the atom that, pr that, 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 that is safe enough that, that, is, that, that prevents releases of these radionuclides. And all of these radionuclides have significant harmful effects at very, very low concentrations. So the answer is no, you can't do that. Um, and I should say one thing before, in the little time I've got left is that in terms of Fukushima, people in the United States, their attention is in the wrong places. They're concerned about the concentrations of radionuclides in, in, in Pacific tuna, which are very, very low, really much lower than the levels, for instance, in Europe, in the in herring in the Baltic Sea, which is, we, we have levels of 50 becquerels per kilogram in herring in the Baltic Sea. So, I'm, first, earlier I reassured everybody about what would happen if, the, I mean, well, not people in Japan, but, but, you know, people in the United States if it all went up. But the people in the United States have, have their own problems, and the dangers there are much greater from the local nuclear I was about sites. to say, now whenever they have a, a leak or a problem, they don't even tell you. No, that's right. And, and, and so if you're worried about radioactivity in fish, you want to worry about the fish that swim in the river, which is fed water by the nuclear reactor near you. Because a map that I've seen of the United States with nuclear reactors is like, like somebody's thrown a lot of darts at it. There are an awful lot of nuclear reactors, and they're all very old, and they're all falling to pieces, and they're all leaking like sieves, and it's all going into the ground, and it's all going into your food and your water. Sure, what about the number that I see of 91%? CBS News says 75% of reactors are leaking. Uh, well, what's the real number from your research? I would think 100% is the number that are leaking. It's, it's absolutely not possible to, to function with a nuclear power station without it leaking. It can't be done. That's what I was because told by Captain Don Darling, who's the head of Veterans for Peace here in Austin. He was on nuclear submarines as a captain and then ran the famous super submersible uh, rescue subs. And he said they're all a bunch of liars. He said they would have them do tests where they turn the reactor on and off, frying everyone on board. Uh, he's had incredible health problems. I mean, he just, just concurs with what you're saying.
Of course, the problem is that, you know, you, it's like being stabbed and then you die 10 years later. So it's very difficult for you to actually take any case on this or, or actually do anything about it. And the stuff is invisible. So unless you have all sorts of radiation measuring equipment, the, the best that you can do is just get out of the way of any nuclear power station or anything to do with it. Just, just run away. Um, and I've got, even then you're not safe because, of course, you've got all the fallout from the weapons. I mean, people living in Marin County, California, of course, you know, for example, have a very high level of breast cancer because of all the fallout that landed in the Rockies after the Nevada tests and then washed on down into San Francisco Bay. So, you know, you need to know what's going on here and you need to be sure. aware that you're all being radi irradiated the whole time until you stop these people from continuing to release these substances. And of course, now they're talking about not even mothballing 40-year-old facilities and letting them go 50, 60. So, uh, those are guaranteed to blow up. Well, of course, of course, they're just trying to make money. It's all about money, isn't it, Alec? That's what it's about. Keep the things going because you can make more money out of it. Well, I mean, what can we do? What can we say? I mean, it's a political issue, and until you can sort out the political situation and have people that you can trust... Well, look at Fukushima. The uh, they're, they're building more reactors even after that. I mean, if you go by Mombiot, if one blows up in the U.S. or France, they'll say build more. It's like, it yes, blew yes, up! Well, I know, I know. Well, but Monbiot, Monbiot is a fool. I mean, nobody takes any notice of him. And in his attacks on us uh, and his, his advocate advocating new nuclear power stations. He's totally shot himself in the foot. Nobody listens to him anymore. LLRC.org. Uh, Dr. Busby, thank you so much for your time. Okay, you're welcome. Wow, Hi, simply you. amazing, folks. I've done the research. I've talked to other physicists. It's so horrible. I mean, it's we got to get rid of these things. I mean, that's just, we got to do it. Nightly News tonight, 7 o'clock. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News. And over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones radio show live as it happens. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show.